So this is Julia Sanagata, one of the automation and networking managers here at Rumsey Electric, and I appreciate everybody joining the call today. So today, Dave Kang will be talking through wireless applications and how we can effectively use it on the plant floor. As many of you know, Dave is one of our networking specialists and has been with us for quite a few years. He'll talk a little bit about his background. So with that, I will turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, let's see here. Uh, my name is Dave Kang. Um, I am one of the networking specialists with Rumsey Electric. Um, so, uh, as I say a long time ago now, I spent uh, about 13 years in the IT world doing data center networking, uh, business continuity, virtual migrations, cloud migrations. Um, I usually say any buzzword you can throw, I've had a hand in. Um, I made the transition in 2016 to OT networks and have since been specializing in industrial networking. Uh, really just analyzing consequences of Ethernet on the plant floor and how to protect the performance of manufacturing networks. Um, what we're going to go over today are the types of wireless, uh, wireless Ethernet in particular, uh, what affects performance of wireless, uh, various topologies and applications, and how to best optimize your wireless network. So when we talk about wireless in industrial applications, what do we actually mean? There are many different types of wireless in the industrial space. Uh, wireless IO, for example, which delivers IO over uh, considerable ranges at 900 megahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. There is cellular wireless, which we often use for long distance site to site communications over a VPN or for uh, remote access to a machine that's already in a facility. But what we're discussing today is wireless ethernet, what it is, how does it work, and what you should realistically expect in their performance. Uh, wireless ethernet for industrial is at the core no different than the wireless you have in your home or office. Uh, these days it's one and the same. And uh, it really just allows devices to connect to one another. It's that simple. Let's talk about wireless Ethernet, better known as Wi-Fi. The term Wi-Fi was actually coined in 1999 as a marketing slogan by the now named Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, the standard for wireless fidelity uh, that was uh, deemed to sound a lot easier to say than IEEE 802.11b direct sequence. Uh, so. What Wi-Fi is, is a family of wireless networking protocols based on the IEEE 802.11 family of standards and is designed to work seamlessly with wired Ethernet. So that's kind of an important consideration. Wireless Ethernet is designed to work seamlessly with wired Ethernet. Therefore, to an endpoint, uh, it uses an IP address and performs the same way as any wired Ethernet device. Wi-Fi has gone through multiple iterations with 802.11b being the first back in 1999. Uh, so this chart shows the various Wi-Fi standards and their new uh, generation-based naming, uh, which was created in 2018, along with what frequencies each standard runs upon and their theoretical link rate, uh, throughput or bandwidth, if you will. Currently, most commonly found in existing industrial applications is G or N, but that is rapidly changing to AC, and we will see AX in the future. There's, um, you know, right now a Wi-Fi 6 push uh, for adoption at this point for home devices, cell phones, et cetera. Uh, but really what you're going to see in industrial space is G and N. Now, some of you may be looking at these link rates and saying, you know, if it's rated that fast, why does wireless then always seem so slow? The reason for this is that wireless technology is run at half duplex. What this means is that once a client is associated with a wireless network, it's only capable of sending data or receiving data, but not both at the same time, like a wired connection. Data over a wireless connection can only go one way at a time. So um, half duplex coupled with the fact that the entire listed link rate is for the total of all nodes makes a wireless connection behave like a hub. And I really hope none of you are still using uh, hubs in your environments. Um, so this bandwidth sharing creates congestion, disruption, 
data collisions, and drop packets, all these things that were present with hub technology. So that sounds terrible, but it's actually extraordinarily resilient for industrial applications, which as you all know, is really a minuscule amount of data. Uh, the information to send and receive, uh, typically a matter of bytes, just um, a lot of it. In the chart that outlined wireless generations, you may have noticed the 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz frequencies listed. What's the difference? Um, at the most basic level, 2.4 gigahertz is a lower frequency, which effectively creates a longer range to the detriment of speed. The speed is going to be slower, but since it's a lower frequency, it has better capability to penetrate, hence the better range. Conversely, five gigahertz has a higher throughput, but shorter range. This is because higher frequencies have a much harder time going through solid objects, if at all. So now that we have a baseline understanding of the origin of the signal, what happens once the signal is sent? What factors can affect the distance and bandwidth performance you're expecting? Aside from the intrinsic half duplex nature of wireless and the fact that throughput is shared among all nodes, performance is also affected dramatically by physical objects. The effects on signal strength fall under the following categories. Reflection, in which the signal radio is a radio wave, right? It can bounce off of various surfaces. Uh, metal in particular, which is a material, material you're very likely to see in a plant, uh, is highly reflective. Uh, so it can cause a lot of interference when receiving and weakening of the signal. You have refraction, which is bending of the wave from material composition which causes a direction change. Something as simple as a window or even water, the signal passing through may cause lower data rates and may cause resends of the data and um, an overall lower capacity. Diffraction, um, the signal is bent around an obstacle. So the direction and the intensity of the signal change and um, in outdoor applications, especially the terrain itself can create the situation. Uh, changes in elevation, such as a hill, or even a ditch can cause uh, diffraction in the signal. Scattering, uh, this is what you might see indoors, uh, dust, humidity, um, manufacturing facility particulate, um, any porous surfaces like a mesh or a fence um, can even cause the signal to disperse. So is your radio signal going through a chain link fence? Um, that's also something that's gonna affect the signal predictability. So it might make sense. Okay, let's raise the antenna over the chain link fence so it doesn't have to pass through that. Uh, absorption, wood or concrete, absorbs a signal and converts that energy to heat, which diminishes the power of the signal. And jamming, um, intentional or not, jamming is still uh, considered a de denial of service and can stop wireless signals from reception or transmission. Now on the topic of jamming, though rare, uh, leads to a good point about wireless channels. Within the wireless frequency bands of 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz, these are divided into channels. 2.4 gigahertz has 11 over overlapping channels and three that don't overlap. Uh, five gigahertz has 23 non-overlapping channels and nine that don't use dynamic frequency selection, so are actually selectable. So huge difference here, you have uh, a device that occupies a channel within the spectrum. If it's in an area with a lot of overlap, a lot of congestion, uh, they all have to share that space and that's when you end up getting a lot of interference. Uh, so 2.4 gigahertz uh, really has been around for quite some time and has widespread adoption. Nearly every device that you come across would support that ba uh, frequency band. Uh, phones, Bluetooth, microwaves, other uh, Wi-Fi devices. It's very, very congested. congested. Um, the example that I always think of is um, trying to use your Bluetooth earbuds in a crowded place where everybody's running, like uh, if you've ever done uh, like a, a race or anything, like a, a running race, Everybody's got Bluetooth and it's nearly impossible to hear anything out of your speakers there. Uh, right now, far fewer devices use the five gigahertz frequency and it's much less busy. Uh, plus new technologies like uh, MU MIMO or multiple user, multiple in, multiple out, significantly reduce the congestion by forcing efficiency in the consumption of wireless resources. The power of transmission will vary significantly with the type of antenna as well. 
An omnidirectional antenna follows a pattern similar to a light bulb, which will radiate signal from a central point, creating a sort of dome of wireless signal. This is a common uh, type of antenna found for a wireless access point or hotspot. A directional antenna is more like a flashlight, which will send a focus beam of signal to a specific target, typically another directional antenna, to achieve a longer distance. And despite the term wireless, wireless technologies actually use quite a bit of wire cable, right? The most shining example of this is the cable from the radio to the antenna itself. Uh, there are ideal points where an antenna can be mounted, but where is the radio? In between, there has to be a cable. The recommendation is to always use LMR cable. It's a type of coaxial cable that's heavily shielded and designed to transmit signal with minimal loss. Um, insertion loss or attenuation, another term for that, increases as the length of the cable increases. So longer the cable, the more loss. Therefore, if you have an application where your antenna needs to be mounted, say 50 feet away, it doesn't really make sense to get a 60 foot or even a 75 foot cable. You should measure and get as close as you can because I'll just have some extra cable results in additional signal loss that you didn't need to have in the first place. DBI is the decibel related to isotrope, which is a ratio value of the strength of wireless signal in any direction. Um, here's an example of a 5 gigahertz uh, directional 7 dBi panel antenna on the left versus a 2.4 gigahertz omnidirectional 6 dBi dome antenna on the right. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to see. I couldn't get a color picture for this one on the right side, but you can see how the signal radiates in a single direction for the directional antenna and on both sides for the omnidirectional. For a directional, the higher uh, directional antennas, the higher the DBI, the greater the distance, not area. While um, higher DBI with omnidirectional creates a larger area of signal, but not necessarily distance. Antennas are in many different form factors, such as the dome and the panel uh, from this example. Uh, but you'll also see a Yagi or stick or even a parabolic type of antenna. Um, an important thing to remember when selecting an antenna make sure that the type matches the type of radio. So 2.4 uh, gigahertz radio should go with 2.4 gigahertz antennas and 5 gigahertz with 5 gigahertz uh, radios and antennas respectively. Uh, some antennas are uh, designed and built to accommodate both, uh, but uh, it's the recommendation is to match the frequency band you're using. So uh, most wireless vendors will not give a definitive distance. Um, that's because there's so much variance in how far a wireless signal can travel, as you know uh, now from all those factors that we went over before. Um, we talked about the reflection, re refraction, absorption, all that stuff, but all those obstructions, um, ant antenna types, and then the power of the antenna itself. And additionally, ranges are really only good as the client, right? So you might have a wireless radio sending out a signal five miles. Your smartphone might pick it up, but would your smartphone be able to return data to the radio at that distance? No, it's pretty much absurd that that would happen. So think of in terms of a ping, right? This would be a situation where one end would send a ping, it would be received, but the receiving device would never be able to reply. The end result is still just a loss of connection either way, right? This is why we would often suggest conducting a, a site survey. So this is a type of engineering study which will determine the best possible locations of transmitters depending on the layout of the facility. This is often done, but not always, uh, by generating a heat map to maximize coverage and range of the wireless signal. So how can all this be applied? Hey, Dave, before yes. you jump into topologies, you covered a lot there between the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz, choosing antennas and why that's important, um, possible use of site surveys to make sure you have the right coverage. Does anybody have any questions about that stuff? Um, I know some of it, in theory, you may be a little familiar with from your home Wi-Fi, you may see that you have two networks coming out of your Comcast or your Fios router now. Um, does anybody have any questions about that before Dave moves on? No? All right. We'll take silence as a good thing. 
Just want to make sure. Yeah, it means everyone's following. That's good. All right. Thank you. Uh, yep. So, uh, why would you use wireless in the first place? Uh, mostly in situations where you're otherwise unable to run an Ethernet cable uh, indoors because it's impossible to add a wire or outdoors due to the costs of burying fiber optic cable, uh, trenching permits, pulling wire, digging replacement repairs when it's all completed. Uh, it's just a lot of hassle, right? So uh, wireless alleviates the expense time, engineering, and effort. Uh, it constitutes significant cost savings, faster deployment, and a properly, with a proper design, a very scalable solution that can uh, grow and contract as necessary. Um, wireless can be used for mobile workers, uh, integration of tablets, smartphones, laptops into systems uh, without the need for a wireless connection as well. A wireless radio can function um, as well more than just a wireless access point. Um, that's the most common use uh, for it to be used as a Wi-Fi hotspot, similar to what you might have in your home or office. But um, consider the fact that a laptop, tablet, or smartphone has a built-in embedded wireless interface. Does a PLC or drive? Wireless radios can be put into a client mode that associates to a wireless access point and may be plugged into the RJ45 port. And that gives a non-wireless device wireless connectivity. Some wireless access points can be associated to other wireless access points to repeat the signal, thus extending coverage or being even uh, able to create wireless mesh networks, which can increase throughput without degrading the signal as a repeater might. A wireless radio serving as a wireless bridge allows a set of wired devices on a switch to associate to a wireless access point, thus allowing all those wireless devices to connect to the rest of the network. So take, for example, two islands of automation with their own switch with the HMI, PLC, et cetera, attached um, to that switch. And now um, with a uh, wireless access point as a wireless bridge, both sets of wire wired devices can now communicate with one another. So here's an example. Um, add a control cabinet, adding a control cabinet in a remote location to the control network. Uh, this is a simple point-to-point -point connection, which is effectively a cable replacement. Um, no conduit or disruption to activity. Another common stationary application is a point-to-multi-point -multi -point connection from a central location to multiple remote locations such as you would commonly find in, say, a water or wastewater plant. In this example, uh, cost and effort, manpower and time, all prohibitive, prohibitive to run a fiber optic cable to locations um, at distances of more than 1,500 feet. A wireless radio was installed in the main control room and at each of the control panels at the clarifiers, um, creating that wireless association and uh, thus having a single um, network amongst all those devices. In this scenario, due to regulations, the foundry uh, here required accurate and traceable logging of material composition. So PLCs were actually installed on each crane to measure material composition with an HMI and a wireless radio. Radios then were installed in the control room for the purposes of acquiring data from these cranes. Cabling was found to be impossible in this application and the material composition data then uh, wirelessly was uh, able to be sent directly to the control room for uh, data logging storage and thus easily fulfilling the regulatory compliance. So those were a couple examples of a stationary application. A mobile application for wireless might be anything where the client is in motion and might need to use roaming technology in order to remain consistently connected by quickly and efficiently associating to whatever wireless access point is closest. Um, super useful in a modular cart system, uh, very common in pharmaceutical, where the equipment might need to move but remain connected and perform that data collection without loss due to regulatory concerns, for example. As shown here, this uh, red circled cart must be part of the rest of the no uh, network. Uh, notice there's no cables connecting this system to the rest of the network. Um, it moves in the direction of that blue arrow and associates and disassociates with access point as, it's move, as it moves. So it has roaming capability. 
Another example of this would be a warehouse, which uses automated guided vehicles for picking and retrieving. It wouldn't make sense for the vehicle to be tethered. Um, so, uh, you know, if the, ne if the necessity is for it to move freely about the facility, uh, it can't be wired to anything. So multiple wireless, connect uh, wireless access points are mounted in various locations. A wireless client device is mounted on the AGV, which is capable of roaming quickly. This ensures that if the AGV moves out of the range of the associated access point, it can quickly and easily associate to the next closest one. It really just allows uh, freedom of movement throughout the warehouse or facility, whatever it is, um, and just has this untethered ability to uh, associate and disassociate with networks. Now, mobile application doesn't necessarily mean that anything is moving far. It could be a situation where equipment is rotating and cable can't be installed due to damage or abrasion. In this example, uh, a bottle filling station was experiencing constant rotation, so the Ethernet cable is twisting, abrading, and causing failures. Uh, the end user experienced continuous downtime due to troubleshooting and repair of the cable. A central wireless radio and antenna was installed on the rotating center and allowed wireless communication back to the central control system without cable. So wireless installation subsequently eliminated the wear and tear and any of the downtime associated with that. Radiating cable is a relatively new wireless technology for mobile applications, which allows the cable itself to act as an antenna. This is particularly useful in situations with a mobile client following a fixed and repeatable path that never goes beyond a few inches away from the path of the cable. So radiating cable can be found in automotive applications, monorail or train control, or even in amusement park rides. This is Skyfall, a free fall amusement park ride with uh, multiple installations around the world. Uh, it uses a compact logic processor to lift and drop 24 people in free fall for 262 feet. Uh, the design has recently been retrofitted with radiating cable on a fixed repeatable path, that up and down motion, uh, using uh, ProSoft wireless radios for control. Now in this example, a machine builder uh, for uh, mobile device integration uh, has mounted a small self-contained wireless access point and antenna to their machine. This allows a worker uh, with a tablet, smartphone, or laptop to associate to the um, built-in wireless um, interface on the uh, local machine network uh, from their device to the network, that is. Um, they could then access the PLC for programming, pulling data, or looking at HMI screens directly on the mobile device. Uh, it's particularly useful in scenarios where the worker might have to go through a time-consuming uh, PPE donning process or enter the machine operating area. And uh, similarly, similarly, in the case of a dangerous environment or limited access area where it's simply unsafe for a human being to enter, a uh, small space, electrified area, cage with a robot, et cetera, a simple way to remotely access local machine network is by using one of these devices. Um, even if it's not an environment like that, though, consider the process of gaining access to a cabinet, just plugging into the cabinet switch, identifying an available IP address, then finally gaining access to the network, just to have a look at the status of a bit or a tiny change. This can all be eliminated by using wireless communications. It's simple to implement, saves time and resources, and is absolutely a future technology that you should be using now. Uh, I believe that soon it will be more strange for a machine not to have this capability than to have it. Here's another example of mobile device integration using wireless. Uh, consider some of the programs and apps that are available in 2020. Uh, so here's an example of Factory Talk Analytics for devices. Um, it is a box that scans your automation technology and checks specific tags for problems, uh, budding problems or alerts that it thinks you need to know. It might be cycle time or a consumable um, that needs to be replaced. Uh, if you have an engineer or technician with a mobile phone on the same control network using a wireless access point, he or she now has all those alerts and maintenance notifications right at their fingertips on their phone. So technology is really amazing and wireless can help you take advantage of it. Now, given all that we've discussed, what are some tips here? So, 
A site survey will give extremely valuable insight to the layout, configuration, materials, and best placement of where to install wireless equipment. Uh, typically, it'll test for uh, congestion at the frequencies and channels intended for use, um, and the evaluation will determine which frequently and channels to use. For directional antennas over long distances, the line of sight is imperative. You now have some idea of what your beam will look like. Be certain it's aimed to the other side appropriately, and also that nothing is obstructing the line of sight. Maximize your signal strength by having the right equipment designed appropriately with an antenna cable that's consistent with the actual length you require. Stop the loss before it starts. Finally, this is the most ignored one, basic network management. Unmanaged networks are not acceptable in a wired or wireless network. Wireless Ethernet is designed to seamlessly interoperate with the standard wired Ethernet, like I had mentioned before. So these recommendations are not just because of wireless or only for wireless. Uh, for production, safety, and performance, it makes no sense not to invest in managed switches and the know-how to use them to protect sensitive automation equipment. Know your RPIs, know your timeouts, control your multicast traffic, and if you haven't started reducing broadcast traffic on your network, research VLANs. Rumsey has multiple articles and webinars that speak to this topic. Thank you very much, folks. Um, and uh, that's all I have for, to, for you today. Um, were there any questions or uh, any situations that anyone's run into that they want to talk about or any, anything anyone wants to share? Nothing. All right, well, thanks, Dave. Um, hopefully everybody found that very informative. And if you do have an application or something you wanna kick around or you're thinking about wireless, that email right there, datacom at rumsey.com or certainly Dave King's email address is a great way to get a hold of any of the networking specialist team. And they will be sure to help you out with it. So with that, I think um, we will wrap it up for the day. As you can see down at the bottom, there is a web address there. Every Tuesday at 11.30, we do do these webinar series intended to be technical more than anything else, insider tips and tricks from the specialist team. So if you haven't looked at what's coming up, please feel free to hit that link and look what's coming up. Thanks, Dave. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon.